Now, the word that came to my mind during these studies that we've been doing in Connect and in church is the word sustain. Um, I think it came from the picture of the mother and the baby. So this word's been playing in my mind for some time, sustain. So I'm going to ask you the question, what comes to your mind when you hear the word sustain? Maybe it's those bags of sustainability that you get in shops. Maybe you think of food and water straight away because you think, well, I need food and water to sustain myself. Um, maybe it is the picture of the mother and the baby that comes to your head first. That's what I got. Um, or maybe you're a musician like me who thinks straight away of like a musical term. Um, so sustain in music is when you hold on like a note or chord for a long period of time. So if like Daniel was on the keyboard, he'd press the key and then he could let go and hold a sustain pedal, I think it's called, and it would hold on the note that he's just played without him actually playing it, if that makes any form of sense for non-musicians. So the note is held on for a long period of time, even though your finger is off the button. Um, in Hebrew, the word sustain means to carry, to nourish, to hold, to keep, to provide, to help, to support, to strengthen, quite a positive word. And when we turn to Psalm 54, 4, which I'm presuming you've all got now, um, it says there, surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Um, the words that stood out to me there was surely, as though to say like, isn't it, isn't it obvious? Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Now I'm a teacher, so I immediately like look at things and go, Ooh, what does this word mean? So sustain is a verb, which Ryan doesn't know what a verb is, I have to explain it to him. Verb is a, do <laughs> is a doing word, okay? So what this verse is saying, that this is something that God is doing, and he's still doing it. Yeah. The Lord is sustaining us. It's something God says he does. And when God says something in his word, when he says he's going to do something, and he's doing something, it happens. So it's truth. Um. And when I was reading this, I thought, wow, this word sustain is so powerful and it, it shows so much strength. It's quite a thorough word for our thorough God. God doesn't do things half-heartedly. God doesn't just go like, okay, well, I'll kind of help. Um, this is a thorough word that he's used in his word. It's more than just keeping us alive because initially I thought, okay, sustain, we're sustain was just sort of getting there like we're we're barely alive um, but it, it doesn't mean that at all um, sustain isn't just keeping us surviving it's actually allowing us to thrive yeah. so that's the difference when we've got God in our life he's not just enabling us to survive he's actually enabling us to thrive and there's a big difference between those two words um, now, I was speaking to Alicia a couple of weeks ago, and Alicia and I love plants. We've got this in common. But the difference between Alicia and I is Alicia allows her plants to thrive, and my plants barely survive. Um, and this got me thinking of the two words, um, and I've been trying to get tips from Alicia on how to make my plants thrive. But there's a there's a strong difference. When we look at a plant, you know if that's in the right condition, you know if it's thriving, and you know when it's barely surviving. Yeah. You can see that clear difference. And it got me thinking, like, what do I look like to other people? Do people look at me and think, she's barely surviving? Or do people look at me and think, wow, she's thriving in Christ? So, 
I looked through the Bible and I thought, okay, let's find evidence to prove that God is our sustainer, like it's saying in Psalms. Um, so I've got two pieces of evidence to show that God is our sustainer. There's hundreds more pieces of evidence, but I've chosen two. Um, reason number one is found in Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. So I'll let you turn there, and I'll need to turn there too. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Oh, sorry. Hebrews is next to Timothy and Titus. Okay, so it says here, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Amen. Wow. So when I read that, um, the, the pieces that sort of stand out is like, oh yeah, we know that God created the universe. Because we'll often refer to God as our creator and we'll often refer to him as our saviour. Those are words you hear quite a lot. But in that passage in Hebrews, it also mentions the word sustaining. So that also suggests that he is our sustainer, our all-sustaining God, the one who keeps everything together, the one that holds everything together. So he's not just the creator that created it and went, okay, here you go. I'll just leave you to it. He is the one that is still continually holding it all together. And we know that because it says sustaining. The I-N-G at the end shows that it's continuous and ongoing yeah. right now. Um, wow, that shows me that our God is all-powerful, all-purposeful, and completely praiseworthy. He is the cosmic glue that holds this earth together. Yeah. Um, and the crazy thing is that scientists, right, they are trying to find out through science what this mystery cosmic glue is. That's, they're actually trying to study to find out what that is because they don't know. They know little bits of information through science, but they have no idea how this universe is being held together. And they call it the mystery cosmic glue. When we open to Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, we can see yeah. what that mystery cosmic glue is. Our all-sustaining God, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's amazing. Yeah. That's one piece of evidence, a big piece of evidence to show that he is our sustainer. He's holding the universe together. He's sustaining all things, including us. The second piece of evidence um, that I found was he is our all-sustaining God because he is the air that we breathe. Now, we sung that song um, last week, like, this is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. Um, and I think God was speaking to me back then because like, this message seems to flow into the song. That's how amazing he is. Um, we're not alive fully until the breath of God is within every single one of us. Because we've just got to turn to Genesis 2, 7 to see that Adam was formed out to clay by God. We know that bit. But he wasn't living until God breathed the life of God into his nostrils. That's found in Genesis 2, 7. So 
without the breath of God within us, we would actually be clay statues because that's what Adam was before God breathed the breath of God into Adam. He, he formed like a clay statue out of the dust of the ground and the important bit was the breath of God that was breathed in to Adam. And that is the same with us today. We need that breath of God in us to, to sustain us. Um, the breath of God has been sustaining humans since Genesis. And I don't think we stop enough to even think that because we just do it naturally yeah. and forget. It just happens. Um, musical term again, I'm sorry, I've got to refer to a guitar. Um, when I was thinking about the guitar, in order to sustain a note on the guitar, it's a little bit different from the piano, you've got to play a string and it vibrates, okay? And then that vibration pushes sound waves into, like, see that circle bit in my guitar that you see? It pushes the sound waves in there and then it creates, like, a beautiful sound. Okay, so that's the sustaining vibration that goes through the guitar, creating a beautiful sound. I thought this was an amazing picture because we are like the guitars. So us as people, we're the guitar. And we need God's breath flowing through us for us to be beautiful. For us to make a beautiful sound, we need the breath of God flowing in and through us to sustain us and create a beautiful sound, just like a guitar does. And then I thought, am I, am I that beautiful sounding guitar? Or am I a guitar that's like abandoned at the side, letting like moth, moths just fly into it instead? What am I allowing to flow through me? Is it the breath of God? Or is it other things that I'm allowing to sustain me and flow through me? Do we act like God is our sustainer? Do we act like it? Or really, is it our family that's sustaining us? Is it our friends who are sustaining us? Are we depending on them? Is it our career that's sustaining us each and every day? Is it our hobbies? Like hobbies are great, but is it the thing and the only thing in this world that's actually keeping us alive, keeping us going? Are we depending on that? Are we depending on social media to sustain us every single day? Like that one quote that you see on social media and then it's like, oh yes, be still and know that I am God or God's so great. And you're like, oh yes, that sustained me today. Is that the only thing that is sustaining us as humans? Because that's not what the word of God tells us to do. I don't know about you, but I can start out like really well and I can think, okay, yeah, I'm doing great. Like God is sustaining me. I'm depending on God. Um, and then before I know it, I think that I've like backslidden. God's told me I've backslidden and he tells me quite clearly if I'm depending on something else. Um, it could be that I'm allowing Ryan to sustain me as my husband. It could be that I'm depending on my job too much and I'm allowing that to sustain me. Or I'm quite bad for the, the quotes on social media. I think that that's it. God's spoken to me that day and that's all I need. <coughs> Um, in, in my devotional this morning, I'm actually going to read it out to you because I thought, wow, this is great. This is linking to, to this, this message. Um, so it's not my words, um, but it's, it's definitely God speaking. It says that many people confuse pleasure, contentment, and joy. So we've got those two words, th three words, sorry, pleasure, contentment, and joy. So pleasure can come from like a good holiday, a pay rise, or a bar of chocolate. I like a bar of chocolate. I do get pleasure from that. Um, but people, um, including me, we can become pleasure addicts. Always seeking the next fix. We're always seeking that next thing. 
but these experiences of pleasure always come and go. They never last. So that's pleasure. And then we've got contentment. Now, that's longer term because that's kind of like being satisfied with your life, your family, your job, your church. You're, you're quite content with everything. But again, that's going to come and go. Joy is the word we need to remember here because this is another kind of happiness for us as Christians. And anybody can experience this if we trust in God. Joy is not a fleeting emotion, but it's a deep way of being. It's a state of mind that is available to every single one of us. And it's not found in things. That's the key. Pleasure and contentment is often found in things. We often put things in the place of God. But joy, it can only be found in a person, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. I had to share that because I was like, well, God's even speaking to me this morning saying that this is the right message today. The Bible tells us, you see, that God's mercy is new every single morning. Every single morning, God's mercy is new for each and every one of us. And that tells me that we can come to him every single morning expecting something different. He is the bread of life for every single day. It's not a one-time thing where we go and eat a piece of bread and then we starve ourselves for weeks. He says to come to him daily. His mercy is new every single morning. Great is his faithfulness to us. I believe that God is a fresh word for every single one of us today to sustain us today. He's not expecting us to live on the word that he gave us a year ago to sustain us today. That's the amazing thing. He, he wants us to be in a relationship with him, a constant conversation with him to, so he can sustain us, that we don't, we don't need to sustain ourselves. But in order for that to happen, we've got to be in close proximity to him, like that mother and baby image we've got to position ourselves in that close proximity to God our father our sustainer and we must seek him like the baby seeks the mother yeah. and that's often all the time throughout the day often and the baby craves the mother's milk yeah. we must crave to be close to our heavenly father daily moment by moment not once every month or once a week when we come here and hope that god's going to speak to us like god can speak to you in your bedroom at home god can speak to you when you're washing the dishes god can speak to you in your quiet time with him you don't need to come here to get your one piece of bread from God on a Sunday. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that the first question that God asks Adam and Eve in Genesis is, where are you? That's in chapter 3, Genesis, verse 9. Where are you? That's what God says to Adam and Eve. And he's asked them that, not because God is stupid, he is not stupid, he is all-knowing. He asked them that because he knows that they're hiding, like it's obvious that they're hiding. But he's asking them that because he wants them to think about the position of their heart. He wants Adam and Eve to think about, where are you compared to me? Like, are you in close proximity to me? And the answer is no, they're hiding. Um, and when I was reading this this morning, I actually felt God ask me that question. I put my name before that question going, Leah, where are you? I really felt God asking me that. And that is challenging. Like, Leah, where are you? Yeah. In relation to God, where am I? Am I close to him? Am I like miles away doing my own thing? In Jeremiah 29, 13, 
It says, seek me and you will find me when you look for me wholeheartedly. I love this verse because when I was younger, right, it it just reminds me of my childhood because I used to read the first bit and say like, okay, seek me and you will find me. And I used to go into my room and be like, God, I'm seeking you and I'm going to find you and then be disappointed when I couldn't see him, um, (laughs) which was just kind of funny in my childish state. But I guess I had the right heart, but was I doing it wholeheartedly? I don't know. I missed the second part of that verse. You'll find me when you look for me wholeheartedly. So that's not a half heart effort. That's not one foot in, one foot out while we're scrolling through social media or we're watching TV or we're choosing to eat cake or we're choosing to multitask rather than choosing the wholehearted response to coming towards God. Is it a wholehearted approach that we choose or a half-hearted approach that we choose to seek in and find in our Heavenly Father? You see, if a baby, I keep going back to this picture because it's just engraved in my mind. If a baby was being breastfed by the mother, if that baby was distracted, now I've seen this, I've seen this with a lot of children. Like if there's a TV on in the background, the baby kind of gets distracted and is like turning away from its mother and is wondering what the noise is, wondering why people are talking. You see the baby gradually getting disgruntled that's a very Doric word, I'm sorry. Um, you, see, you see the baby getting really um, frustrated and tired and, and they just start crying because, one, because of the distraction, but two, they're not getting what they've came to receive. Yeah. They're not getting that spirit, um, they're not getting that milk from their mother. They're not getting enough nourishment for that feed and I think I'm like Leah this is this is me like that I can totally relate to this a lot of the time where I wonder why I'm walking around disgruntled and unsettled as a Christian and it's because I'm not getting enough nourishment from what I'm supposed to be getting nourishment from I'm getting distracted by the TV in that image of the baby and the mother. I'm, I'm being the one that's getting distracted rather than turning my focus yeah. to God. So that's why I end up barely surviving, let alone thriving. God promises that when we seek him, he will sustain us. He says that in his word. He is a faithful God and he never stops sustaining us. He never stops caring for us. He never stops supporting us and holding us. He promises to do all of these things. You know, it says in Isaiah 46, 4, it's such a lovely verse because it says that even to our old age and gray hairs, I've not got gray hairs yet, but I feel like it's coming that way, or even not even just gray hairs, even if you have no hair, right? It doesn't matter if you've got hair or if you've not got any hair. (laughs) Ryan's looking at me. Um, The point of this verse is that he will always sustain us from childhood to elderlyhood, if that's a word. (laughs) All of the time, our whole life, he will sustain us. That's got the word will in that verse. I am he who will sustain you. That's like a promise right there. If we let him, of course, if we let him sustain us, he will. I think the key I found to allowing God to be my one true sustainer. So to avoid these distractions and to allow God to be who he says he is, the key that I found is vulnerability and humility. 
because that's exactly what a baby is. A baby is completely vulnerable, completely humble and dependent on its mother. You see, it's easy to sing, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's easy to sing that when everything's going perfect in our mind. It's easy to sing that when everything fits into our box of perfect. And oh, I'm in control of my own life just now. I'm sustaining myself. But we're almost pretending that God is. We're pretending that God is the one that's doing it. But actually, we're depending on ourselves. We're depending on our friends. We're depending on social media. We've, we've got our dependence on other things completely. But we almost convince ourselves, the enemy tries to convince us that we're depending on God. And it's so easy to sing when everything's like that. It's so easy because we're singing on a surface level. We're singing it half-heartedly, not even engaging with what we're truly singing. I've been there. I think the challenge is, and the rubber really hits the road, as Stuart would always preach, is to keep on singing when there's lack, when there's pain, when there's emptiness, when there's hurt, when there's tears, when there's no fruit. In this complete sense and state of vulnerability, where everything is just not in your control at all, I think that is the place where we truly see our God as our one and only sustainer because we've got nothing else to hold on to. And hallelujah that God actually allows these moments to open our eyes. Thank God that he uses these difficulties that we, every single one of us face, I know we do. He uses those difficulties to actually turn our eyes towards him, to actually turn it into something good that we realize, actually, God, you're all I've actually got. Nothing else can sustain me at all. You are the only thing that I've got. We we come to this place of complete humility and vulnerability. And everything else grows so, so dim in comparison to God. Everything else just does not matter but our Heavenly Father. If I'm being honest, actually, I don't even need to be honest. You guys know, if you know me, you know that I like to be in control. I'm a teacher, so it just, it's in my nature. It always has been from a young age. I was just bossy, and I was told to stop being bossy. Um, But God has really tried to point that out with me like I know that it is a a weakness of mine and and God always points it out when I'm trying to be too much in control um and I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit of testimony with you all because I don't really speak about it and you might think oh like Leah's got everything together she looks really in control of her life Uh, no um, I'm not, and I think this is why God's kind of said, Leah, you need to share a little bit today. Um, over the last year, it's been over a year now, um, my health hasn't been the best. You might not think that, because I'm standing up here with a smile on my face. I'm good at that. I'm good at putting on a face, but my health hasn't been the best. Um, and from childhood, really, I've, I've had issues, um, but they've been manageable issues. And praise God, doctors have been able to help. Um, But over the last year, I've realized that there's things that doctors can't help. When I was a child, I thought doctors were almost God. They cured things, they gave me medicine, and that was it. It was like, oh yeah, I'm better. Um, But over this last year, I have realized in my confusion, in my pain, in endless doctor's appointments, no matter which doctor you go try see, no matter how you try and help yourself, I've realized that there's some things that only God can control. There's days 
where I have woken up and I don't think I can get to work. Um, and the only thing that keeps me going is praying, God, be my sustainer today. And by the grace of God, I've, I've gotten through teaching a class and I might have to leave early <laughs> without Sharon noticing <laughs> when the bell rings because I'm absolutely knackered by the end of the day, but God has gotten me through the day. Um, there was one morning I really didn't think I was going to get to work because I, I nearly passed out, which again, I, I'm not saying this for you to be like, oh, Leah, what a shame. This is something that's actually been going on, but I just never share these things. Um, it's, there's a medical term for it, but basically when a cramp gets so bad in your stomach, your body basically shuts down, and this is what sometimes happens. So one morning it happened randomly, and I believe this happens because the enemy is trying to stop me from doing what God's called me to do. Um, often it'll happen before church because... The enemy is trying to stop me being here, worshiping God and sharing the word with you guys. Um, So I do believe it's the enemy and I pray against that completely and I stand on the word of God. Um, But in this world, we will have trouble. Um, But take heart, God has overcome the world. Um, So one morning, I nearly passed out, but I've got a strategy for that because I stick a, a sugar cube up the top of my mouth. And this is a strategy my mom learnt me um, from a young age. So this sugar cube keeps me from completely passing out. Um, It basically increases my blood sugar to keep me half awake. Um, Poor Ryan has to stand there and try and hold me up while this is happening. Um, But anyway, I was like, oh, there's just no way I can get to work today, or no. And by this time, it was like 8 o'clock, and I had to be at work very, very soon. Um, In that moment, though, despite the craziness of what was going on, you might think that's just insane, um, I had such a peace when I focused on my breath because everything else was blurry. I couldn't see anything else. That's just what happens. Couldn't see anything else at all. Couldn't function at all. The only thing that I could hear so clearly, like beating in my head, was the sound of my breath, like, and I just got such a peace from that because like we've been sharing today, he is the air that we breathe. And in that moment, God said to me, Leah, I am the only thing sustaining you. And it makes me emotional to say that because like, it's, it's bringing me back to that moment. But it's so true. In that moment, I had a, such a peace because I can depend on so many other things that are not God. But in that state of vulnerability, you realize, oh my goodness, Lord, you are the only thing. You are the only one that's given me breath and sustaining me, and we are not promised tomorrow. I'm going to end on this thought because I'm looking at the time. Um, But this isn't my thought. This is something that I've read before, and I'm not saying that it's biblical truth. This is just a, this is just a thought. Um, the name Yahweh, so we know that Yahweh means um, the Lord God, yeah? Some people have like studied this a little bit, and they think that the sound of the consonants in this word, so Yahweh, um, the sound of these letters in Hebrew, they suggest that it actually sounds like our breathing. So I'm going to try and demonstrate, but this is not accurate. So bear with me. Um, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Now, I'm not saying this is biblical truth. Please do not quote me on it. But 
wouldn't it be amazing if that was true? Wouldn't it be amazing if the first breath that we took, we said the name Jesus, and the last breath that we took, we said the name Jesus? Wouldn't it be amazing if when somebody is arguing with us, like disagreeing with God and saying that our God is stupid, wouldn't it be amazing if all we're breathing back to them is the name Jesus, our Lord, our Savior? Wouldn't that just be an absolutely beautiful picture? And you know what? That's the kind of thing that God would do because he's an all-creating God. Like he's that integrate with his details, that that wouldn't surprise me if he has actually designed us in that way and that there's some thought put into the sound of our breathing, that it is actually his name that we are breathing. Um, It's just such a beautiful picture of how his breath is sustaining us 